And we are back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal. Stephen Bezruchka, I'll spell that for you, B-E-Z-R-U-C-H-K-A. I'd spell it for you because you're going to want to read his new book. He is a medical doctor. He is also a public health expert. And his new book is entitled, Inequality Kills Us All, COVID-19's health lessons for the world. Dr. Bezruchka is Associate Teaching Professor Emeritus in the Department of Health Systems and Population Health and, Glo and of Global Health, I should say, at the School of Public Health, uh, University of Washington, and he joins us now. So first of all, Dr. Bezruchka, uh, thank you for coming on the program. Uh, thank you for having me and also pronouncing my name correctly. It's uh, Ukrainian. And well, RCH is is a big, is an important part of it. Yes, absolutely. Well, Escal, uh, my grandparents are from Ukraine also. Uh, you'd be surprised how many people get my name wrong, even though it's phonetic. And that includes primary school teachers. But um, at any rate, uh, so tell us, if you would, if you don't mind repeating it, uh, just a brief overview of what your book is about. And then we'll get into some questions. So I worked as an emergency physician for 30 years, and the easiest diagnosis I could make in the emergency department was that somebody was dead. And so uh, if, all I had to do then was fill out a death certificate, and uh, that would be um, tallied with a birth certificate to uh, discover how long, how old that person was, how long they lived. And if you tally up these death certificates for a country, I was shocked to learn that we live shorter lives in, than people in a varying number of countries. Now it's, uh, you know, some 45 countries or 50, depending on who you consider, have better health as measured by longer lives. So, you know, most of us, uh, given the choice, would rather be live a longer life than a sicker, shorter one. So the, that, you know, I was dumbfounded since I knew uh, we had the best health care system or so I thought. And, uh, and so I tried to explore why. And beginning almost 30 years ago, I, I, I returned to public health school and I went to Johns Hopkins, which uh, uh, was the best international school with my question of why the United States was not so healthy. And I came away recognizing that uh, political choices that a country made really determined its health. Healthcare was a minor player and personal behaviors. This, you know, what I always thought was really important uh, also played a lesser role. That's very unintuitive in a country uh, where you believe that your health is your choice. You can choose to do what is required to be healthy. But now, although you have some choices, they're limited by the choices society makes. So inequality is the big player. That is the gap between the rich and the poor, which is a political choice made by the whole country, then translates into a variety of systems that affect our health. For one thing, uh, a bigger gap between the rich and the poor creates a lot of stress. And in the United States, stress is the 21st century tobacco. You know, we don't smoke much anymore, only the poor smoke, but all of us face a lot of stress, and that stress is a killer. The other thing that any inequality does is limit the expenditure or the programs that affect early life. What I learned was as we go from the erection to the resurrection, the first thousand days before you, you uh, blow out two candles on your second birthday is the critical period when roughly half of our health as adults is programmed. So healthier countries have policies in place to privilege early life. And those countries need to have money to spend on that. 
and they do that by having a small gap between rich and poor. Yes, so thank you for that. And, uh, you know, as I was reading your book, uh, I had actually prepared notes for an article at one point that I never completed. But yeah, what I was trying to do, and you'll know this well, was track the progression of what came to be known in the 19th century as social medicine mm -hmm. to um, what we now call public health. And you kind of gave us a snapshot of that in your introduction because social medicine, I'm blanking on the name of the physician who, who first came up with a term, went to the mines of Silesia and saw how, uh, you know, Beer yes, yes, of course. Uh, Beer right. And uh, how social conditions affected lives there. Somehow in this country uh, and in the West, Western countries in general, but I think especially the United States, social medicine uh, evolved into public health and your professor emeritus at a school of public health, among other things, and public health evolved into personal health and to me that reflects an unspoken ideology that reflects the idea that if you're sick it's your fault that and that your health is your responsibility uh, which uh, ignores the fact that for example poorer people and and largely black populations tend to live in more polluted environments and you know we could go on and on you, you and and you detail much of this in your book but the idea uh, that's one of the things that seemed to be so important to me about your book is that it brings back that sense that uh first of all that my health is not just my responsibility your health is my responsibility and secondly my health is to an extent dependent on your health and to me it feel i mean i don't want to uh, put words in your mouth but it seems to me that one of the messages of your book and the reason why the title is inequality kills us all is one of the lessons of COVID 19 is it may not do so equally but it is not even in the self-interest of the powerful to allow so many people to be so sick is that a fair interpretation Yes, the, uh, the hardest thing to uh, get people to consider, and it's in the title, Inequality Kills Us All. There's nobody, um, no matter how wealthy they are, that can escape the hazards of the inequality that they have chosen to produce in our society. Uh, there are many ways of trying to describe that. Uh, you know, first of all, there's the socioeconomic gradient. Poorer people have poorer health. You alluded to that. Uh, you know, a, a graphic example uh, are uh, who survived in the sinking of the Titanic. If you had a first class ticket, 60% survived. Second class, uh, 40%. Third class or crew, 24%. So what's the lesson there? Always travel first class on the Titanic. So you see this everywhere. Poorer people, those lower down in our supposedly classless society, do worse. But even the rich, remember only 60% of the first class passengers on the Titanic survived. And if we think about it, uh, the oldest old person, you know, if, if the United States was such a healthy country, surely at some time, the oldest old person would be living here. That's never the case. And if we think of notables who died before reaching age 60, you know, Elvis, Marilyn, Steve, uh, Jobs I'm, I'm referring to, uh, you know, they, they died young and many others do. And yet we revere old age. Every, every day now I look at the obituaries in the paper and the age of death is always there. And today, the, in the New York Times, uh, there are a person or two died in their 40s and some in their 90s. Given the choice, we'd rather live a longer, healthier life than a shorter, sicker one. But that's not the choice we have in the United States.
Well, uh, I'm glad to hear you say we revere old age in this society. Uh, I'm not feeling it myself since my hair turned gray, but perhaps I will someday or white. But uh, um, uh, but I understand what you're saying. We prefer to live, and it's interesting that of all the of the three people you cited that were wealthy and famous, um, they did not die young because of inequality, right? They they kind of broke out of their their newfound class level. I, Elvis died because of drug addiction. Uh, I think you named Marilyn Monroe was that one. Uh, committed suicides. They tell us uh, Steve Jobs elected to go for alternative medical care that didn't work. So um, you know we do tend to. Uh, see the early deaths of famous people as, as tragic and they get publicized, but somehow as a society, collectively, we don't, uh, we don't sh have that empathy for the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of not famous people who die early, do we? See, see that's a big problem for me. I struggle with this, that a million dead from COVID, uh, most of whom were not famous, most of whom were lower income, as, as I read the statistics, most of whom, you know, some of whom could have been helped, some of whom were the victims of racial disparities in healthcare and income and so on. But it seems to me that we as a nation are capable of grieving Queen Elizabeth, who lived to a lovely old age, you know, healthy uh, for most of it, cognitively and so on, and yet incapable of absorbing or grieving for the million who died of COVID. Do you get what I'm driving at? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So uh, let's rewind to uh, 2001, September 11th. 3,000 people died on that day, or roughly. And what did, what was our response? Well, uh, we put in the Patriot Act. We invaded two countries uh, under false pretenses. You know, Iraq had WMDs. Forget they were never found. Uh, and in each country, we killed about a million people. So that was our response to the loss of 3,000 lives in a very visible uh, uh, event. On the other hand, uh, we're now uh, close to a million one hundred thousand deaths from COVID, uh, many, many times uh, more than September 11th, and uh, there are no. Uh, that's an example of structural violence or uh, right. social uh, death. That is, they died because of things we could have done but didn't. And, uh, and there's going to be no investigation into that tragedy of much greater proportions. You know, there was a lead article in the, in the New York Times a couple of days ago saying, uh, well, whereas we had a 9-11 commission, there won't be one from our COVID one. And that sets us up for many more uh, pandemics like that. I think we're entering the pandemic scene. We're entering the age of being vulnerable to a lot of pathogens because of the way we've destroyed the environment and natural habitat, and it's going to bite us. You know, Doctor, I, I ventured, uh, I used to work with health statistics, but I haven't done it in a long time, and I ventured possibly well out of my lane since I'm rusty, but I wrote a piece recently where I tried to put two facts together and we're, you know, we're just talking about COVID for now, but when you talk about the pandemic scene era we're entering, one of them was talk, uh, and it was hard to dig these statistics up, but one of them was saying, you know, there are X number of new cases. Uh, I could look it up now and, and get you the exact numbers, but you had X number of thousands of new cases per day globally the other was for every million new cases that six new variants emerge vote most most variants say i'm told are harmless but some are not some are more virulent some are more aggressive maybe much worse than we've seen even now if i understand uh the literature correctly and so in effect it struck me and strikes me that we're playing russian roulette with with our own 
lives and the world's lives by letting this thing go on that that you know one of these could be the uh, so lethal we can and so so easily spread we can't even imagine and am i being alarmist uh no you're being a realist uh you know the <laughs> as yogi bear said it's very hard to uh know about the future and uh but we you know these pandemics have been predicted for a long time and uh, so here we are in this one and are we going to be prepared for the next one well we haven't learned any lessons from this one and uh and and what are those lessons well we need to put in well we need to garner the trust of people around the world uh, that we will need to take collective action to first of all redress what we've done to the natural environment by destroying so much habitat we at least have to stop doing that i mean you know the uh, global warming is an example of of our of that and we've created the habitat for these uh, pathogens to grow and we don't have a response you know the the immunizations that we uh, uh, fostered yes they had a benefit in decreasing deaths in old people but they really didn't prevent infections right. and they were uh, they were imperfect and so i think uh, you had a guest on your show uh, a, a couple of years back uh, uh, maybe i'm wrong suggesting that an imperfect vaccine during a pandemic could lead to the age of variants that we're in now now that was never seriously discussed because as soon as big pharma produced normally uh if we think about the pharmaceutical industry they don't touch drugs for prevention and that's like shooting themselves right. in the foot they also right. don't work on drugs for cures because why cure something when you can make a lot of money maintaining a person with that condition with expensive drugs but the government uh spent a lot of money and that was not talked about to pfizer and moderna to produce these vaccines so they did it and they had huge profit margins so you know the capitalist system uh worked in its traditional ways to get the vaccines out there and yes you know uh, i've i've had my my vaccines and boosters because i'm old and yes it does prevent death but in the future we're going to have to find a more creative and effective way of limiting the effect of, of vaccines so you know in the subtitle of my book covid 19's health lessons for the world what did we learn about uh, inequality and covid in a study of 84 countries more income inequality was linked to worse outcomes from covid within the united states states or counties that had more inequality had more deaths from covid and and so how does that happen well in a country if there's a smaller gap between the rich and the poor people trust the government people trust one another they're not so stressed out by the uh by the gap between the rich and the poor and they work together with a big gap between the rich and the poor uh you know you don't want somebody to get ahead of you and so you um and you reserve your servility for people like you and you push the poor down george bernard shaw did uh wrote this eloquently in 1927 about we reserve our civility for the people similar to us but we uh push the poor down you see this with uh, road rage, you know, people with uh, there's a lot more road rage now. Uh, it's the same in, in passenger airplanes. Having a first class cabin means more belligerent behavior in the whole plane. If you enter through the first class <laughs> cabin, the first class are wigged out. And uh, but if they, you enter behind the first class cabin, uh, there is less air rage in first class. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, we what's what's happened is we've created 
very stressful conditions. And how do people deal with that stress? Well, you mentioned, I mentioned uh, uh, Elvis and, uh, and Marilyn. Yes, they died of drug overdoses. Our overdose drug deaths are now at a record, never, never seen before. And this is even after the uh, Oxy and Sackler and, uh, and Purdue Pharma uh, drugs are no longer so easily available. Why? You know, we consume three quarters of the world's opioids. We're only 4% of the world's population. Why is that? It's because we're incredibly stressed and the opioids are a reasonable stress reliever. Right, and, and, and excuse me for interrupting, but it, it, it's also struck me in the conversation around, uh, maybe it's changed a little bit now, but many times I've heard the conversation around drug addiction in this country, alcoholism, and you know, you're well aware of the studies that uh, Angus Deaton and Susan Case did on uh, the death, so-called deaths of despair rising among, you know, well, they focused on working class uh, white males who, you know, who uh, are distinguished primarily by their declining, you know, minority populations have always struggled with this, but a group whose economic status and hopes for the future has been declining, uh, rising rates of alcoholism, opioid abuse, suicide, and so on, contributing to the U.S.'s falling longevity rate. The, but it seems to me there's always been an element of judgmentalism, or often been an element of judgmentalism uh, among powerful or comfortable people in talking about this when there's a part of me that says, you know, uh, you know, I've been to these places. I, 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 I've seen it up close. I, I lost a nephew to opioid abuse. I, I, you know, when your life is so unequal, so unfair, you see it every day on TV, uh, you have no prospects, you have no hope, your community has no hope. You know, it's not unless we provide help, it doesn't strike me as entirely irrational to look for escape. Yep, yep. And, uh, so it seems to me the compassionate answer is not just let's get a few billion out of the multi-billion dollar Sackler family and leaving them billionaires and we'll use it for some kind of uh, post facto intervention for a handful of people, but address the root cause, which is the hopelessness that, and as you say, the stress that's become endemic. But I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I, it was just an observation. Yes, um, so what, the, uh, the study on the deaths of despair. So these were people, middle-aged people, and Angus and uh, uh, Angus Deaton and Annie Case looked at mortality rates among those people and compared them with other people in the United States and similar age people in other countries, other rich countries. And uh, the mortality rates for the white people, 45, 45 to 55, were rising slightly over the last couple of decades. For the other countries, the mortality rates were declining. So uh, why was that? Well, basically, as you point out, People, people believe that their life is under their own control and they're here to achieve the American dream. And for whites especially, and that's been, that was the reality for some in the 1950s, but it's certainly gone and only the rich uh, achieve the American dream and the rest of us have to be asleep because it's an American nightmare. So what has happened is they, they blame themselves for no, they, they don't blame the society. They don't blame right. the government. They blame themselves, and then they do they do themselves in by the by drugs and alcohol and suicide. I mean that's a remarkable thing. Suicides have gone up in this country, uh, in, in, in both in the young and in older people, and that's quite a remarkable phenomenon. Um, and it you know if we could make people realize that their poor health is not their fault. It's the fault of society. And 
Um, one way I think to, you know, we Americans can rise to being shamed by another country and do something about it. What I'm suggesting is the fact that 60 or 50 to 60 countries have better health. If Americans knew that, they could then do something about it. The best example, in 1957, the Russians launched Sputnik, and uh, we were totally unaware of it. We were nowhere near doing anything like that. And this satellite, you know, beeped a signal to us, and, uh, and, and, and we were, in a sense, terrorized by that. So what did we do? Well, we, we had been shamed by another country, and so we set a goal to land a human on the moon and beat Russia by the end of the 1960s. So countries can set goals and they can achieve them as the United States did in, uh, with the moon landing in 1969. So similarly, if Americans were aware that we're dead first and that that was not the result of their personal behaviors, but the result of policy choices we've made, we could set a goal um, to, to at least uh, become one of the healthiest countries in the world as we were in the 1950s. Just right, you know, uh, you begin with, uh, Dr. Bezruchka, you begin with showing just how far we've fallen in the past 70 years, and it's uh, it's astonishing. But before I let you go, and, and I, again, I do re uh, recommend the book, Inequality Kills Us All, but um, let's, let's spend our last few minutes on uh, your thoughts about solutions. You've already begun. You've you, you mentioned, you know, uh, kind of health race, uh, the way we had the space race after Sputnik was launched and whatever it was, 1959. Um, so let's talk about, you know, if you would just briefly, your thoughts about how this is a change in national consciousness we're talking about. This is it right? This is a change of how we perceive ourselves as a society, where we see that we are failing miserably, and can we collectively take up the challenge? What are your thoughts on that? So one of the things we have to do is distinguish health and health care. Right now in the United States, many people say uh, we access health, pay for health, get health, ensure health when it's really healthcare is the commodity that we're accessing. So we, by using the terms uh, 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 like together like that, we think it's healthcare that produces health. And yeah, healthcare is important, but it's a minor player. All the studies show that. So, but we should have universal healthcare to begin with, because other rich countries and many other and poorer ones have universal healthcare and so if everybody has health care and we're still less healthy than so many other countries, there's got to be another reason. So, yes, let's bring in a policy of universal health care, Medicare for all, however you want to put it. And then you have to realize that uh, in the United States, John Kingdon, a political scientist at the University of Michigan, said that for major policy changes, People have to be aware that there's a problem. They have to be aware of a feasible solution. And then you need some transforming event. Uh, the transforming event could be, well, World War II set a lot of things in, in place. Uh, COVID uh, um, could be our transforming event. Here's this whole issue that, that caught us uh, unprepared. So, what we have to know there's a problem. We have to know that there's a solution, that there's, we agree on a solution and then the transforming event. So what is the solution? So I detail in chapters uh, nine and 10, what individuals might do, namely the, begin to talk about these ideas, what organizations might do and what we need to do collectively as a society. And if the gap between the rich and the poor is killing us, well, we need to uh, lower the gap. And how do we do that? 
well, let's have a wealth tax. Let's increase our income taxes to the highest marginal rate being 91% in the 1950s. It's about 36% now. And, uh, you know, we, back when our tax rates were much more progressive, we were one of the healthiest countries in the world. We didn't know that it was taxation that helped produce that, but the studies are very good on that. So, you know, I, I, I will give you absolutely the last word, but I, I did just want to mention that for a while, uh, you, you mentioned Elvis early on, um, Colonel Tom Parker, who was Elvis's manager, and at one point he was quoted as saying, I consider it my patriotic duty to keep Elvis in the 90% tax bracket. And so I used to measure the top tax rate by what I call the Elvis index, how it <laughs> measured up against this 90% tax rate, right? But uh, uh, I love the fact that you've tied that to uh, to the state of health for the country. And um, any thoughts about beyond reading your book, of course, about and informing themselves about what people can do to bring this shift into being? Because we both know there are powerful forces that don't want it to happen. The wealthy, the political processes is currently structured and so on. Uh, any thoughts about that, about the future? Well, in my courses, uh, because of, of COVID, uh, they were held online and I could no longer have students do community outreach exercises in person. So they did them virtually. They, they would use Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, uh, and they would re, whereas in a, in a physical meeting, if you got 10 or 15 people out, that was pretty good. But with uh, uh, the uh, the social media, they could reach thousands, and they did. So I think that young people who are uh, experts in social media can get the word out. They've got to they've got to be uh, they've got to learn effective ways of presenting these ideas, and then who knows what will go viral. I'm I'm I have a lot of confidence in the ability of young people to spread the word. You know, uh, Greta Thunberg in Sweden uh, just started holding up a sign on Friday, and somehow the conditions were right for that to go around the world. And she's a huge influencer. It's young people who want their lives to be healthier, who want their children's lives to be healthier, that will, I think, lead the way. And of course, by viral, you mean the good viral. The good. Um, yes. Well, I strong again, I strongly uh, recommend the book. It is entitled Inequality Kills Us All, COVID-19's Health Lessons for the World. The author is Dr. Stephen Bezruchka. Uh, thank you for writing this book. Very informative. And thank you so much for coming on the program. And thank you for having me. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escow, and this is The Zero Hour.